Hello, and welcome to our first Cavalry conversation of the fall 2019 semester. Uh, I'm Dan Fagan, I'm the director of the Science Health and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops at NYU. And I'm very excited uh, to bring, to help uh, bring a new series of conversations, uh, starting with this one, about an incredibly timely and important topic that raises really difficult questions for science communicators, uh, and that is uh, how to handle Ebola and other uh, highly infectious diseases. And we have two fantastic guests, and I will leave it uh, to Lee to formally introduce them, but I'll just say that uh, I offer my deep thanks to Dr. Nahid Bedelia and uh, also to Amy Maxman uh, for taking the time to join us, and I'm really looking forward to this. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Robert Lee Holtz, science writer at the Wall Street Journal, distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU, and veteran host of the Cavalry Conversations. I don't know what number we're up to now, Lee, but I think we decided it was over 100 recently. <laughs> so it's a lot. So take it away, Lee. Oh, this is where I take a deep breath. So welcome to the Cavalry Conversations on Science Communication. And as Dan uh, points out, this is the first in our fall series. They're sponsored by the Cavalry Foundation and the NYU Science, Health, and Environment Re Environmental Reporting Program. Um, and uh, just quickly to give you an idea of what we have before us um, after this evening, on October 8th, we'll be talking about opioid addiction uh, with award-winning author Beth Macy, author of a wonderful book uh, and disconcerting book called Dope Sick, and Johns Hopkins University bioethicist Travis Reeder, who has uh, written quite movingly about his own opioid addiction and his um, efforts to control it. On October 29th, we'll be delving into the power of photography as a uh, science storytelling device with renowned National Geographic photographer Lynn Johnson and uh, Wesleyan visual historian Jennifer Tucker. And on November 12th, we will um, have a special screening of a remarkable documentary film called Bias. Uh, we will have the filmmaker, Robin Hauser, with us. And we will be joined by a pioneering Harvard social psychologist named Mazarin Bajani, who will actually be rather unique. We'll have audience participation, some real-time cognitive testing on implicit bias. You think you aren't, but I can tell you in advance you are, and we'll explore that. All of these, of course, will be webcast. Now, those of you who are watching online, I uh, encourage you to uh, send us your questions via Twitter using the hashtag uh, Cavalry Convo, and, and we will ask those for you and answer them as we go. But we are here now live from New York, as they say, um, so please, everybody, this is a conversation, not a lecture. We start this conversation this evening at a particularly troubling moment, I think, in public health and science journalism. We're confronted with a range of emerging diseases, such as Ebola, uh, and the resurgence of infectious diseases that we thought well controlled and conquered long ago. I'm talking malaria, I'm talking measles, I'm talking polio. And new viral infections such as SARS and MERS. And this week, as some of you may know, um, a yet another uh, perhaps emerging outbreak of Ebola in Tanzania with uh, controversy running between the World Health Organization and the government of Tanzania as to whether they are in fact trying to conceal this epidemic from the eyes of the world. Now, an emerging epidemic is its own kind of war zone and places special demands on doctors and reporters. And that's what we're going to explore this evening. What can we learn from an evolutionary biologist turned reporter uh, and from an expert in infectious diseases turned TED talker um, about the journalism of outbreaks? And we hope that their differing perspectives will tell us something important about the, how the news of this uh, public health uh, journalism is changing and how it reaches popular culture and how we can all do a, a better job of it. 
So we are joined by Amy Maxman, who has come to us from San Francisco this evening, and Dr. Nahid Vidalia, who has joined us from Boston. Now, Amy is an award-winning science writer, some of you may know. She covers uh, medicine, evolution. She's very people-oriented, and her works appeared in Wired, National Geographic, the New York Times. She's currently a senior reporter at Nature, where she and her motorcycle um, are based in San Francisco. Now, her work um, is stellar. It's been anthologized in the best American uh, science and nature writing. Uh, her coverage of the Ebola outbreak has uh, earned a Society and Journalism Award from the National Science uh, Association of Science Writers, just to name uh, one or two of her honors. Um, the big thing is, prior to writing, she uh, got a PhD from Harvard and then decided to spend the rest of her life slumming with uh, journalists. We'll find out why in a minute. Um, further, uh, Nahid is an infectious disease physician and assistant professor at Boston University School of Medicine. And in particular, she's medical director of their special pathogens unit. Uh, she is uh, responsible for providing medical backup uh, to the maximum containment research uh, conducted at the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratory at BU. And um, her specialization is in infection control issues, um, particularly with uh, uh, reference to emerging pathogens and highly communicable infectious diseases. Now, um, for our purposes, um, during the uh, West African Ebola epidemic, she served as a clinician in several Ebola treatment units, working with the World Health Organization and Partners in Health, and uh, she's a subject matter expert for the U.S. Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, the Department of Defense, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, and, and Tuberculosis and Malaria, and the World Bank. Now, what they have in common, um, actually, Nahid has been a source for Amy. Uh, Amy has written about Nahid's work, but what they have in common is a disease. And uh, I'd like to, to, to start um, our conversation tonight by asking each of you, to me, this is a very strange and frightening way to spend your time. Um, what is it about Ebola in particular, Amy, that attracts you? <laughs> it's a funny way to put it. <laughs> but yeah, I find, I find Ebola very compelling. And I think, um, well, one, it is just terrible and it's terrifying and things that are dramatic are compelling. So it is, it's, it's awful and I think, you know, now he's been inside of Ebola treatment units so she can tell you what it looks like when within a few weeks you might hemorrhage to death. So it's awful. Um, and it's terrible also in other ways because it's the people who are like caretakers of the sick. So somebody who's willing to, um, you know, die to take care of someone who, who gets sick often. So it's sad. It's, it's important and then also it's interesting to me because there's other things that kill people, but Ebola has lots of other layers. So there's the layer where, um, there's kind of a cultural layer where how it affects society, like if people become afraid of going to, to health centers, um, um, if people, if there's an economic impact, people lose their jobs. Um, and then there's this other component where Ebola is a national security concern for the U.S. So um, there are I'm sorry, national security concern? For the U.S. So the U.S. is afraid of Ebola coming here. So unlike ah. something like cholera, yeah. Suddenly, this is a political disease. How long is the care. flight from New York to? Well, to Sierra Leone, it's yeah. well, it, it would be short, but you have to you have to have like, have like a long layover in Casablanca or something. Um, but it's not that far, no, and people do that. travel. Yeah, there's direct flights okay. from places to you know between DRC and there's direct uh -huh. flights into France, to Belgium, to Dubai. So. Um, yeah, so it, these things travel, so that's why they're of concern to the U.S. 
-huh. That's kind of the crudest right. way that they're disconcerting. Um, so then you get politics involved, and there's sort of layers mm -hmm. of that sort of concern. So I'm I find sorry, you're a lot dodging my question, my friend. I didn't ask why us. Yeah. I asked why you. That's why, because <laughs> me, I've, I'm interested in all of those things. So I think, you know, I left, I stopped doing science where I'm really focused on one thing. I was studying sea spiders, so I was focused on one little thing. With Ebola, it's not, this about, yes, the virus is interesting, but on top of it, there's like, 400 other stories that are happening. So as a journalist, there's one topic, but there's lots of various avenues to go down. Mm -hmm. So that's so why here, I like Let me it. ask a variation of the same question to you. <laughs> um, uh, this is a specialty in infectious diseases, of course. There's no shortage of infectious diseases in the US or in North America, or, and we've just rattled off the names of a few of them. What is it that's compelling to you about this? Is it the setting? Is it the uh, is it the romance of travel and a disease? Uh, I mean, seriously, what uh, is there something scientifically about this that gets you? It's definitely not the romance of travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I, I think there is something different about Ebola, but I think Ebola falls into a class of organization, organisms that we don't know much about. You know, I, I love this idea that there's still these diseases that we found out about since 1976. and. Mm -hmm we still don't know the best way to treat patients with this disease. We still don't know what to do when we find a new scientific fact about it and how we can make, quickly make responsible public health policy. You know, what I love about it is, well, it's the hardest part about it, which is the first 100 patients that you see with this disease, you're learning about the disease from those patients and you have the capacity to either completely miss that information or to take that and apply it to the outcomes of the next 100 patients. And it takes a certain amount of social responsibility. It takes a certain amount of, you know, um, someone saying, you know what, no, this is important. This is about social justice, you know. So it's not just about science. It's about why have we not gotten there since 1976, since we first discovered Ebola. And that appeals to me. And that appeals to me about a lot of emerging infectious diseases, um, which is that sometimes they get left behind because major majority of the time they are diseases that affect poor people. They mm -hmm. affect areas of the world that don't have good healthcare systems and until recently didn't have the ability to get on a plane and potentially affect our defense um, you know, communities. Now, when you uh, last went to uh, West Africa to uh, treat an Ebola outbreak, when was that? What country? Sierra Leone. All of my um, all, all your work's been in Sierra Leone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now recently it's been Liberia, but during okay. that epidemic okay. it was all Sierra Leone. And when you go, you go alone. You go as part of a team. You are in a seven forty seven full of other infectious disease specialists. Or I, I generally go under the auspices of an organization. So uh -huh. um, it was the Global Outreach Alert Response Outbreak Global Outbreak Alert Response Network, the WHO, the first time around at GoArn, and then now. The second time around, I went with Partners in Health. The second, third, fourth time with Partners in Health. And so most recently, that would have been? Most recently in Liberia, I actually am, because it's peacetime, it's in between outbreaks, I am working there on a grant that we received to help build capacity for doing research on emerging mm -hmm. infectious diseases, so through the NIH. Okay. But my home base is always my university. I'm mm -hmm. this weird academic outlaw that like, <laughs> Uh, thinks it's equally important to be out in the world as to write papers about it. Mm -hmm. So don't fire me, be you. <laughs> the uh, you know, so you're part of a of a team. You're part of a, a well developed organizational outreach medical public health squad. Amy, you first started doing this as a freelancer. Would you kind of tell us like how this got started for you? as a loner, I mean, you don't have the institutional shield, if you'll forgive me. Yeah, and there's pluses and minuses to that, too. Um, so I, when the outbreak in West Africa was happening in 2014, 2015, actually it was 2014 when I, I found it just super compelling. I actually had a job at that time. No, where were you editor. working? What were you doing? I was an editor at a magazine called Nautilus, which is like a science and culture magazine. But I was kind of, I was an editor and I was learning that I prefer writing and reporting. So I was for other reasons kind of already thinking about going to freelance. 
And I also really wanted to cover Ebola, and Ebola was not something that Nautilus does. They're a bit more like on the philosophical basic science side, or at least they were then. Um, so yeah, I sort of decided to quit, and I got a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and they pay for travel. Contingent on a couple of basically contracts, not fully, but I had an editor from National Geographic and an editor from The Economist who said, we'd like a couple of stories. So that's enough for the Pulitzer Center to decide. They would fund my trip for two weeks, and it happened that when I got to Sierra Leone, it was so interesting that I extended my ticket a couple of times, and I ended up being there for all of December and then all of February. Can we unpack that yeah. word, interesting? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it sounds pretty interesting. Sick. I sort of just sounded like, oh yeah, D-Day. That was interesting. You know, <laughs> um, what as uh, as a as a journalist now? Okay, so you're an editor at Nautilus, and you have a job. Mm -hmm. You have uh, insurance benefits. You have uh, mm -hmm. you have a desk. Even uh, do you have a desk yeah, to sit at? Oh, you have a desk to sit at. Yeah. Okay, so you are just thinking there, daydreaming in between um, improving other people's copies. You know, what I really need is exposure to an infectious disease. I, I, don't, I don't see that uh, completely as your genesis here. What, what's going on? What, what takes you from a nice, cushy editor's job that many of us aspire to, to the desire to kind of hurl yourself well, into freelancing? Is, yeah, well, I'll, I think it wasn't that I, I think if there had been a full-time staff position for a reporter that was reporting on a bullet, I would have loved that. So I really sure. wanted to, I had missed, I had reported in, and written before that, and I was, I realized that sometimes you have to do something to know what you like, and I think I realized I'm more of a reporter and less of, I like editing sometimes, but I like having my own little baby, which is a lot like doing a PhD. You have your own little project that you're working on. So I missed that. And then when I thought Ebola was compelling, it's just, uh, there were so many story. I think, People at the time, I remember going there thinking there was going to be press everywhere. There was not press everywhere. And there really? were so many. No, I didn't run into I intentionally met up with one reporter, but I, there was nobody that I just ran into. And everybody, and I realized when I got there, Sierra Leoneans that I met, they wanted attention. So it wasn't like people were dodging me. They were like, this is what's happening. You have to write about this. So it was sort of like, and once I was there, I could editors were hungry for stories because there weren't a lot of people on the ground. And I was often correcting, editors would want a story about one thing and I would say, oh no, no, but this is what people are really upset about. So that was interesting. And I had a guest room desk, thanks to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. So you, there was a job in your mind, there was a topic you wanted to cover, there was an assignment that you wanted, yeah. but in fact, there is no job called full-time Ebola reporter. So you created it. Yeah. Now, you made that sound very easy. You skated over that very, very quickly. I, and I'm still back, I, I don't know, maybe I'm cynical, but I'm, I'm really trying to picture the, the editor who will agree to be responsible for sending someone into the center of an infectious disease outbreak, particularly caused by a virus that in many of its manifestations is so horrific that people have actually written sort of semi-fictional bestsellers <laughs> about it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so but we, you know, some okay. of us here are journalists. We want to know how we want to know how to do this. So yeah. let's start with the liability issue. So Nahid, who covers your liability when you go to, into a situation? Oh, like I'm that? so glad you brought that up because I was going to say the underscoring Amy's bravery on this. Uh, I had evacuation insurance from whatever organization I was going with. Evacuation right. insurance, like if a medevac. If I got exposed, if I got exposed, I knew what was going to happen next, or theoretically, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mm -hmm. knew what was going to happen yeah. next. Um, I can't imagine going under um, to, to that area during that outbreak without having that background, but just historically too. You went in December, right? Mm. Do you remember September 2014 or October 2014? That's when the NBC physicians, uh, one of the NBC reporters got sick. And then also others were exposed to him. So we're talking about this hyped up media situation where a reporter had already gotten sick. Um, I forget his name, Ashoka Makbu. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to go in after having all, that have, all of that had happened, I, I think it's just beyond brave. 
Can I qualify that though? <laughs> Just to make it sound that I'm not cavalier, it wasn't that I was like, no, I no, don't no, care. Right, right, right. But I talked, what I did is I talked to some, like, some of the scientists that are best known in Ebola, like David Heyman, one of the co-discoverers. And he was basically like, listen, this is how you get this disease. Working in an ETU is very dangerous. Yeah. Like, if you touch somebody in the late stage of the infection, that's bad, that's, that's very dangerous. But if you don't touch people, and you take all the precautions not to touch, I remember at some point being like, should I use a lot of Purell? And he was like, Purell's not gonna help you. <laughs> <laughs> but he was also like, you know, don't get sick. So I had sort of a, I wasn't completely cavalier about it, and I tried to, you know, I got as good of evacuation assurance as one can buy. But, um, and I had a, my editor at the time at National Geographic asked me for, he was, he was great because although they were not gonna provide liability for a freelancer, um, he did ask for what's my, you know, let's, let's map out what happens when you get a fever. Like, what are you gonna do? Right. Um, so I what's had your blood a type? plan. What's your, yeah, yeah. Well, part of my plan consisted of someone I had known through a friend who was like in the British military. Like, I, it consisted of linking up with people I knew through people who would get me through to, who would get me on their helicopter <laughs> or something. So it, it's not the, you know, it's not a bulletproof plan, but there, I had a plan and I also took steps to not, I decided I'm not going into ETUs. So the person who, who did- ETU uh, stands for- I'm Sorry, Ebola Treatment Units. And so the person who did get Ebola was a photographer and he had gone into an Ebola treatment unit when nobody, he doesn't, as far as I know, he does, I think I once, I wrote him to ask how he thinks he got it. He doesn't know, but he did go into those centers and I decided those patients are so sick I'm not really gonna be interviewing them. And I'm putting myself at high risk and I'll be a huge weight on the system if I get sick. So I wasn't going into that zone. So I'm curious, from your side and your experience, were you running into uh, Western reporters in this, in this environment? Uh, you, you talked about the NBC reporter. Yeah, um, it ebbed and flowed. There were a lot of people, so I was there. Um, through different times in the epidemic. And so at the beginning, there were a couple of people there. And then when that event happened, everybody disappeared. You know, there were very, very few yeah. at all at any one time. Um, so no, I mean, Amy's right. There was really nobody there actually on the ground to the point where I think one of the things that while we're in the middle of all these things, our organizations were getting, you know, knocked on the door, like you have to give us an insight on what's actually going on. How are we going to talk about this and explain this to the public? Um, and in, in and so, yeah, there was a real dearth of information getting out. Um, but I, I will say one comment on, on this. <laughs> totally not trying to make her feel cavalier, but my <laughs> point was she follows, Amy follows, because she's a scientist before anything else, she follows what's scientifically right, right? I was talking about the media hype around this whole thing mm -hmm. um, that would have, and it was, an, it was insane. I mean, even, even for those of us who had been there and were going back, it was like, why would you do this? You know, like, I don't understand. It was like, no, if you understand, you know, how this disease gets transmitted, measles is a lot easier to get than, than Ebola, you know. Well, let me just make that misunderstanding a little bit more concrete. So I seem to recall that on, you returned from one of your trips and then you encountered some difficulty. You want to tell us about your apartment experiences? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, um, uh, so after the, one of the, do one of the MSF docs who was in New York City, um, ended up developing Ebola, um, there was this outcry of like, how can you allow all these, you know, doctors and nurses, um, running around. Again, scientifically not valid because, you know, the putting people in quarantine who've had no exposures or no true, you know, exposures, there was a, actually a, um, it, President Obama put together a panel that actually later on in that spring of 2015 said that was unethical for us to have done that because it basically limited our ability to go back and help, our ability to continue our work. I'm giving that as a background because what happened next was very much driven not by science but by just fear, um, unqualified fear. And, and so all the five, um, they, five, um, five airports were assigned in the United States where everybody would sort of fly through if you were coming from West Africa. And on my return, my second time around, I, I ended up, I won't say the New York airport it was, um, and I was um, stopped and, and, you know, 
went through the whole event, and, and when I got back home, as I, as I was on my transit back home, I got an email from my apartment building saying, oh, you wrote that article in NPR about your experience treating patients. Are you still doing this type of work? And I was like, well, in fact, I'm on my way back. And they're like, when are, where are you planning to quarantine? And I was like, uh, in my apartment, you know? And they're like, no, you're not allowed to come back. Um, and you know we'll pay you a month's rent to stay away. And I was like, can I at least come get my stuff? It's been a really long time since I've been in my apartment. And they were like, no, please send a family member. You know, um, so I, I basically was homeless after coming back the second time around. I had nowhere to go. Thankfully, my family you know lives outside of Boston. I was sort of able to track them down. And you know, only family puts you up after an Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> like. Well, they that's have when you. To, right? That's when you know, right? <laughs> what, what is that phone? That, that's where they have home is where they have to take you in. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. On the so, other side of the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> um, what gave you the impulse to want to write about your experiences? Um, I think that all the Ebola responders will tell you that when they actually went in, and, and you know, Amy, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well because I can't imagine mm -hmm. that it didn't it impact you as well. We all had a certain amount of, we had two things. One was a lot of survivor's guilt, right? Because you're talking about an environment where we're losing 60, 70% of our patients. And I, we lost, I mean, I lost so many um, co-healthcare workers who got sick from this disease, and you know, particularly because just there weren't enough resources to make the care safe. Um, I wanted, similar to the impulse that Amy was describing, I wanted people to know that this is the disease. It's not the disease that's causing 60, 70, 80 percent mortality. It's just the condition. Um, and, and to demystify Ebola, right? If I told you, oh, you have Marburg, does it have the same effect as me saying, oh, you have Ebola, right? Do you even, nobody knows what Marburg is. Marburg is the same kind of virus in the same family as Ebola. Ebola has just occupied our psyche. Um, and I wanted to demystify it and make, it, make the disease about the people. And that's why I wrote um, that experience, the birth experience um, in NPR. So Amy, one of the things um, I found personally quite remarkable about your reporting was the way in which you confronted um, cultural misunderstandings and kind of were able to kind of bridge those for people who were busy um, blaming uh, uh, victims, in fact, for you know their burial practices and things like that. So I'm I'm curious as part of your preparation, um, how how do you how do you uh, ground yourself in another culture from the standpoint of an infectious disease outbreak and sources of uh, secondary infection? I mean, is that something you even thought about, or was that something you discovered upon your arrival? Uh, about learning about how cultures and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I do what reporters do, so I, I talk with people. That's the main way. So I think at first I'll have stages of reporting before I might go somewhere. Before mm -hmm. I went, what do you, you do? I what might, do you do? Um, I always can read books about the place, get to know like some basic history, and um, then talk to people. I think before I went to Sierra Leone this, the first time, I, you know, I'll talk to anyone, and that can be calling somebody from the CDC in, a, in the US who's been there, but it also can be, I think I, I ended up having a really long conversation with an Uber driver who was from Sierra Leone, and he connected me to his friend who is back and forth between Sierra Leone, and I, they put me in touch with like the person who's the traditional leader of like the entire west of the country, so. You got this through Uber? Yeah, actually it was, <laughs> I think it was going, I was going to uh -huh. maybe Thanksgiving, Dinner, which was a, quite a drive, like uh -huh. to, I can't remember some part of Brooklyn that was further, further out there. So no, you know, I'm not asking you to apologize for drive. using Uber. <laughs> I'm just struck at how you're so I'm pretty much uh, open. taking advantage I of your opportunities. I just want to learn. Basically, I want to learn about the country, and uh -huh. so whatever conduit it is, that's a, and that's before I get there. And then once I get there, the same thing. It's about sort of um, talking to everyone. You brought up the. I can talk about the that particular yeah. story yeah. was. This was the story, actually, I, the one story I had before the trip, and it was to National Geographic, and the story was about, at the time, 
the CDC and a kind of sometimes NGOs, I feel like they pick a story that they're going to tell um, that explains things. So they, you know, and that's what they tell reporters. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always some truth in it, and there's always a bigger story. So the story was people are getting infected at funerals. And what happened was there was a woman, there was a woman who died, and through traditional practices, people drank water out of her mouth, and all of her family got Ebola. So this was kind of the classic case. These traditions of these people are spreading Ebola. And then, so I think, you know, so, so National Geographic was like, this is interesting, our tradition's changing, and I had a, luckily, I had a, you know, the editor was interested, but the, you know, if you're working for a good editor, they're also open, and they realize the whole point of reporting is to figure out what's really happening. So once I started talking with people, I think one of the first stories I heard was someone who, um, his family had taken their aunt, who was really sick, to an Ebola treatment unit, and they never heard from her again. She died, no one told them where she was buried, that's that. So why were people not taking you know, their loved ones into hospitals? It was because of an experience like that. So it had nothing to do with some sort of weird tradition or different tradition. It had to do with like a very kind of understandable place. And sometimes there were traditions and people were changing traditions. So I think to answer your question is, mm -hmm. once you get to a place, you learn by just talking with everyone. And that's pretty much what I did. So one of the things that often happens in those situations, uh, as I understand, is of course, you know, you're, you're, well, I don't know, you've got your, I don't mean this in a bad way, but you have your own cultural blinders. Mm -hmm. and maybe there's a language issue, maybe there isn't, maybe you're not sure who's sick or who isn't, so you, um, your initial sources or the people you might reach out to um, are, uh, as guides, kind of, are NGOs, are, mm -hmm. are um, other Westerners in this, in this culture who are there, you know, they're heroes in their own story, but, but they have an agenda too mm -hmm. from the storytelling standpoint. Is that, is that something you encountered? Was that, was that a help or was that a hindrance? I think everybody has their own, everyone has their own motives and I think if you're aware of that, I think, yeah, I think it would be a mistake to, I wouldn't say I would not talk to somebody who was at an NGO or at oh, the CDC. Oh, I wasn't CDC. suggesting oh, that. Oh, yeah, for no, that, but yeah. I, I think it's important to also, then I like to, so actually the way that I t ended up talking to Nahid, I think, I think the way it came about was it was because I was talking to nurses, and I always go out of my way. Once I'm in the country, the whole point of being there is to talk to people from that country. So, of course, there'll be some bias. I'll talk to people who are more talkative and who are more open, and if there's Mm -hmm. And e if they happen to speak English, it's going to make it easier, even if I have a translator. So it's not without bias. But um, I think at that hospital, I talked to you know nurses who were the local nurses working at the general hospital, and they told me about Nahid. So then I came to Nahid. So it wasn't like I talked to Nahid because she was at an NGO, and then I, it was sort of the opposite way around. And, and it's also good reporting because you verify stories that, in that way. You can kind of, once you hear the same thing a few times, you can start to think like, this for sure is a big deal because multiple people have now told me like the same thing. So, Nahid, I'm curious from your standpoint, now you're there because you're um, engaged in treating, uh, uh, trying to control a, an outbreak of a horrific disease. Um, how do you, how do you, as a, as a, as a doctor, as a public health specialist, as a researcher, as a scientist, how do you handle, you know, being a source? How do you, in those conditions, how do you handle being part of somebody's story? Yeah, this is, uh, I think that was the hardest part for me in engaging with media uh, on being on that side is that, you know, so after the first time after I got back, so before I left, there was there was a lot of sort of interest from the media about covering like, you know, why does this person want to go? Like, what is their motivation? You know, and this was right around Camp Brantley had come back, and I wasn't so much interested in that. But when I got back, I was like, you know, there's power in this. Like, there's power in speaking out if it can be done right, if we can raise awareness since there aren't that many people there. But my disappointment a little bit was every time I try to, you know, engage media, um, I take a I'm just talking very generally, of course, it's not true of all, everybody, mm. but I felt that I became the subject of the story, mm. and that's not what I wanted, right? I, I wanted 
uh, people to cover some of the stories that were making this thing so appealing. Uh, and instead, the easiest thing was to say, oh, this person in front of me, let's just write this story through, you know, through their story, because that's, yes, it could be appealing, but it's not original, you know? And um, it was, that was really hard. And, and the difference, I think, with not just the first time we met and the work that we did, you know, and the story that you had reported on, all of, all of Amy's work and all of her reporting was focused on <coughs> national health care listeners, which was what was important to me. You know, it was important to me that that's, that really was one of the reasons that I, I sort of kept going back is really working with the national health care workers and such and, and um, navigating that as, as, it's hard for scientists to become the subject of a story. We're very much comfortable in the role of being an expert. You know, and, and Amy did this wonderful thing when she wrote the story about the healthcare workers where, you know, she included me as a verifying source of, yes, this actually did happen, but she turned the lens to, to the real heroes and to, to the really the more complicated stories um, that were part of, of the situation rather than sort of the easy, low-hanging fruit, um, which I thought was pretty impressive. Thanks. Professor Fagan, you look pregnant with a question. Um, <laughs> I just like pregnant all the time. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. So yeah, I thought I would ask the first question just to encourage everybody to stand, stand up behind me and yeah. also feel free to yeah. insult me. <laughs> uh, so we have you know, quite properly uh, spent a lot of time talking about reporting from there, from the place. Ah, and yes. That, of course, is part of the gospel of good journalism and certainly what we teach here at NYU. Always go see it yourself for all the reasons that we're already learning in hearing uh, these two talk about what they did in Sierra Leone and elsewhere. But I, I guess most of the journalism that people read about Ebola in the United States actually originates in the United States, uh, probably overwhelmingly. Uh, so I guess it would be good to hear from both of you, what do you see in the differences in the journalism that originated hmm. in Africa mm -hmm. and, the, and the journalism about Ebola that originated in the United States? And, I, and connected to that question is, what's wrong with most of the journalism that we see about hmm. Ebola? Uh, yeah. That's a great question. Um, so let me um, ask Amy to start by telling me what's wrong with what you see in the coverage by people who stayed behind. Yeah, and with the caveat that there are of course. very good people. Yeah. But um, I think things that, what is interesting is when, and I'm, yeah, if you have the experience when you're in the country, sometimes you see reporting about what's happening and it's like, so different than the things you're experiencing in the place. So that's how it's like whole different dimensions almost, the sort of the things that will be important in the media when you're far away and you're there, just a different set of problems. So, okay, so for example, um, like, you know, um, the, the reporting that's done in the place will often be very focused on what people are seeing. Like I think Sherry Fink was doing beautiful work in West Africa where she, you know, really focused on um, the people who live in the place who are sick. And that was really what's terrible. And when I was just in Eastern DRC, um, what's awful is the conflict and the poverty there. And the, the way also just conflict has just, the stories I heard from people and how traumatized they are is just overwhelming. But then you'll kind of, what maybe media who's here will be talking about will be kind of these like sometimes just policy issues like it was like a question is it time to when I was there it was in June so is it time to declare a public health emergency of international concern also known as a fake so that was a lot of debate so that's kind of, so it sort of will be this bubble that's sort of divorced from like oh my gosh like can you, can you believe what's happening here like there is huge trauma and there's a real shortage of help for it and so I think it's, so to me, the, f the focus has shifted. And then there's you know, some reporters who are just completely alarmist and not even reporting, I think, very responsibly about you know, how Ebola is spread. And it's, there's always the is it mutating story. 
um, that keeps coming up, which, you know, scientists are looking at that, good question, but once we decide no, we can kind of stop writing that story now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and there's, so yeah, alarmist reporting when there is real alarms, but they're not reporting on the things that are really alarming. And do you have a, a sense of the coverage here versus the coverage by people who are on the scene? I mean, what strikes you when you're home and you're reading about things at a distance? Yeah, um, caveat, it depends on the country you're in because mm. it depends on the freedom of media and ability to write stuff and the impact that has um, on reporters in those countries. Um, so I'll start with that. But I, I think that clearly the heroes of the stories change, right? I, I think that the um, who's responsible or, or, the, or the culprits, I don't know, however you would describe it, right? The, the, the stage is always local. And, you know, and so the stories that I might see if I'm, um, I'm in Uganda, I might be like, oh, this was handled well and this was not handled well or whatever the story is, but it would be assigned to more local actors because uh, that's what people see and that's what reporters see and you know and and, and as, as Amy said when it goes farther away it becomes more global and um, theoretical and, and policy related yes the, it has real implications but the granularity goes away a little bit uh, for sure um, I don't envy reporters in covering emerging infectious diseases right I find this very hard um, as someone who cares very much about this disease where I have all these, I want all these different truths to be out there, right? So one truth is Ebola is a horrible disease and, and, and people are dying not because it's a horrible disease, because there isn't enough help, as I'm sure, I'm sad to hear that's still true in DRC, I suspected that it was, but um, because that certainly was true in, in Sierra Leone. But then there's the thing of like, but you shouldn't have to worry about Ebola because we have a really good healthcare system. You know, like, don't worry, it's not gonna spread like wildfire in the United States if one patient comes here because we have very good healthcare systems. Yes, you might have one maybe case if, if there are people who are taking care of these patients and they don't necessarily have the training or the resources to do this, but it will not be the way it was in West Africa. But then also be like, but you should be worried, you know? <laughs> like, this is a public health emergency and you should really worry about the impact it has on, on everybody else here and over there because it is going to impact how we practice medicine here because we're gonna have to, we're gonna alter the way that we are receiving patients in the emergency rooms with the, but people there are dying of a lot of diseases. So I don't just want you to focus on Ebola. It's, it's not, it's, there's so many competing things that truths that are out there that I don't, you know, I don't even, even as I speak about this right now, I can understand why it sounds completely schizophrenic, but um, I don't envy you. Sure. <laughs> so how do you broker Thanks. that? How do you broker that? How do you tell six truths at once and uh, that also well, I uh, think stay a journalist because right. you're not looking for donations, you're not trying to fund a cause, you're not trying to win sympathy for a beleaguered people or that's kind of fix a, a broken political that's, system that's that's creating. also the really great thing though what I'm not trying to I don't have to try and do anything or change anything I'm trying to tell the world what I see and make it engaging and as honest as it can be and that's it so I don't have to you know decide that I'm going to so I think maybe a mistake is trying to tell people you have to be worried because you're gonna get this and die like, I feel like I want people to know this is happening because it's awful and we should know about the world around us and it's a problem to ignore it. So I just need to try and write a story that's clear and honest and engaging. And if it has a good impact, that's great, but that's not really my number one goal. I want to ask a quick follow-up question. Then. So, all right, when you both are there, you know, you're clear-eyed, uh, uh, baptized in the reality of the outbreak and you see everything better than we do. But when you're back here, as a practical matter, how do you stay on top? What do you monitor? What Twitter feeds do you look at? If I never go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo or to Uganda or to Tanzania, but I want to stay on top of, a, of a, an emerging outbreak as a journalist, and I, I imagine the issue would be the same for a physician who specializes in such things, what are your tricks? What do you look for here that help inform you better about there? Hmm. 
I mean, I'm definitely, I watch Twitter, but then I also, you know, I reach out to people who I know will know things. And if you, once you travel a little bit, you start getting people's, you know, WhatsApp numbers and Facebook. So, I mean, I can't forget about these things because I will, I just have people who will continue to ask how I'm doing from all of these various places. So I still stay on top of it and I can ask them, how are they doing? And then I can, this afternoon, mm -hmm. I had coffee with actually somebody else we both know who's the head of the Nigeria CDC. And so I can ask him about what's happening there for outbreaks. And also I know he happens to know a little bit about what's, you know, he has his perspective on what's happening in DRC with the Ebola outbreak right now. So I can, so a lot of it is just being a reporter and mm -hmm staying in touch with the people who are your good sources and who will just kind of casually just sort of tell you, you know, what they think is going on and you're not taking notes or writing a story, but you mm -hmm. sort of, you sort of hear what's happening mm -hmm. that way. What's the answer for you? Um, well, we have, as on the last question you saw very clearly, we have very different jobs. No, I appreciate <laughs> that. But your sources might be very helpful to me and, well, or, yeah, you know, tricks of the trade. I, I tend to follow, it's a very small community, um, at least for emerging infectious diseases researchers, so I tend to follow a lot of researchers, which I'm really glad there's a trend towards more academics being on, on Twitter. It's a plus and a minus to that, right? Because you're just like, is that, is that your opinion or is that data proven? Are you like pre-publishing? Uh, anyways, but I follow researchers um, and I follow you know trusted reporters. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly enough, a lot of public health um, leadership from a lot of the countries that we are both interested in as well as WHO and others are now directly on Twitter sharing daily mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. uh, which is actually really great so I tend to follow those folks mm -hmm. um, that's all Twitter and then other than that I think for, for me it's 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 my network of people I work with mm -hmm. um, it's fellow researchers mm -hmm. people I collaborate with you know people mm -hmm. that are in countries and mm -hmm. projects that I'm collaborating with, so in either in Uganda or Liberia, yeah. it's just working is with there, them. Is there is there a conference? Is there a three journals I should be reading? Oh, I mean yes. Um, so uh, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, ASTMH, uh, the Clinical Infectious Diseases, um, the, uh, sorry, the uh, in Infectious Diseases Society of America is the other one, and the Society of Healthcare Epidemiologists of America are the three ones that have really taken a lot of, mm -hmm. um, have, have significant portions of their conferences dedicated to some aspects of, of mm -hmm. emerging infections. Are, are these sources you tap? I will look at these journals, but uh -huh. I can't lie and say I read no. them all the time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. You've been patient, sir. Um, so this question is sort of two things. There, I mean, this isn't that uh, difficult of a virus, and there is an effective vaccine as far as I know, yeah? So I understand how it's difficult to get that vaccine spread around the population when there's an outbreak, but can as journalists, you take the vaccine and lower your risk before you go? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, there is a vaccine. You ha Tell me what you think of the vaccine and which strain it's effective against. Yeah, I. Um, we have a vaccine against one species of Ebola, particularly the strain in, in, of the one species of Ebola, but let's just say one species of Ebola. There are four others, and Ebola is one of three other pat organisms that are part of filoviruses, and which is part of a whole network of viral hemorrhagic fevers. So I think it, this is important as a distinction because I think people are saying, well, it's solved, we have treatment, and we have vaccine, but we only have treatment of vaccine for one species. And the majority of the areas where, where these diseases happen, multiple viruses circulate. So we've, do, we've vaccinated over 200,000 people right now with the RVSV vaccine. But tomorrow, if there's an outbreak with another species of Ebola, we're gonna have to redo it. Mm -hmm. We think, I don't as know how much cross-reactivity there is. Thank you. As a journalist, coming into an area like that, do you have access to that vaccine? You know, I could have asked for it. Actually, I know there's a reporter I know who's, uh, he's at Frontline, and I know he got the vaccine when he was there. So we, you couldn't get it here. You'd have to get it when, if I was in, you know, the sit Benny and Butembo, the cities where it is and where it's being given. I could have asked, to be honest, I think I was so aware of the limitations in supply, and this is just to let you know how low I feel my own personal risk is. I was there for a week in the hot spot, and I wasn't going into a bullet treatment unit, so I, I honestly felt like I don't want to use somebody else's dose. 
Plus, it takes like 14 days to kick in or something like that, so it wouldn't have helped me anyways. So no, we can't get it here. That's you can get answer. it under a trial. Um, NIH is having a trial, but it's, you have to know where to look for it. You have to be a person who's going to be at a high enough risk. So Amy would not have qualified as ah, doing it. There you go. <laughs> so many of us um, may never cover an Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa, but many of us, some of the CHIRP students or people like me who are just working journalists could quite easily end up uh, covering a different sort of infectious disease outbreak in the U.S., be it measles or um, self-inflicted uh, uh, epidemics like the vaping business that's going on right now. I wonder what have you learned um, as a science medical journalist working the Ebola crisis that might inform what you do in a domestic outbreak here? What are the sorts of reporting techniques and tricks that might be more generic for this kind of situation? I mean, I've certainly had the experience of like waking up one morning to a, a phone call from an editor who, who wanted to send me into an infection zone for SARS, which is certainly much more innocuous than, than Ebola, but it raises a lot of issues about access and quarantine and mm. preparation. What, what would you share with us? I mean, some of the things I guess I, I already, I'm trying to think of how to answer it best, but you know, learn the basics of the disease, how it's spread, um, how many people it affects, kind of who tends to get it. So I think that's how many people have it, kind of the basics who, you know, you always want to make sure you have the basics covered, I think, in any sort of reporting. So who, what, when, where, just know those things first. Um, I don't know if that, then start reaching out to the people. I mean, I learn almost everything when you ask if I read those journals. So I think I did a lot more often when I was earlier in reporting. To be honest, these days I start knowing, I learn a lot more from talking with people. So start, start figuring out who are the scientists who are you know, the lead researchers in this area. Um, that's always a good way for me to kind of start in and just start talking to them because they can kind of catch you up to speed the fastest, sort of a shortcut. Mead, how would you answer that question? I think the tough question for me, I mean, I kind of always theoretically knew it, but going through the Ebola experience made me realize that it's not just about the disease, right? That whether you die of, of, of a disease or not is a function of who of you as a person, you know, are you, what kind of background have you had? Have you had good health? Have you been able to access that? Um, do you know how to deal with it? Do you have the, you know, the, the healthcare literacy to be able to deal with it? It's the disease, of course, and it's the healthcare system. And it's this marriage of all three factors that just plays out differently, you know, and it's so, yes, the disease is always, is, is important, but it's all those other things that sort of decide whether you live or die from a disease. I think the importance, and so it's interesting because it is hard as a physician who spends more of, I do public health work, sure, but like, you know, I'm a peon, you know, compared to the, right? Most of my work is patient, you know, and, 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 and uh, direct patient care and other things. And so it, it kn knowing those sort of that idea that it's, it's all these other factors um, does does make me feel a little bit more helpless um, and makes and that's what's kind of pushed me to be a bit more in the public health arena as well. Hmm. You have a question, please. Um, so when you're writing or communicating about something as um, serious as Ebola that people are frightened about legitimately and not legitimately, um, how do you like pick your words and craft your sentences and, and think about um, you know, like the weight of what you're communicating without being like crushed on it, under it, or, you know, picking the words that are true that will, um, you know, go through the editor and the copy editor and all, all the way up to publication that you can stand behind. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny. Um, it's a very good question. I think I, my editor couldn't come tonight. <laughs> but um, I feel like a lot of my own personal like emotions over because you do see some very sad things that you can't change. And 
it's not uncommon that people I, who are my sources in the stories, I end up learning they die. And so it's a real thing, and there's a lot of weight to it. And I think my editor pays the price because of the fights we get in. <laughs> what sorts of fights? Like for, you know, when, you know, I feel like in stories that are not this charged, if they want to take out a sentence, I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, all right, you're probably right. This time I have like, sometimes there's emotions attached to it. You know, like when they're cutting somebody's, uh, one of my sources out and they cut that person's quote, if it's something that, something traumatic happened with them, I feel like I get really upset. And I know my editor's working for the good of the reader, so it's good that they're there. But we go back, and I think there was an example from the latest story I wrote. Um, there was one line, and nature likes to be, they try and be concise, um, so they have a very strict word count, um, which I also understand. People don't spend that long on stories. Um, so I couldn't get into the depth of like, like, what, like I said, when I was in Benny and Butembo in East DRC, um, people are really traumatized by some of the fighting that's happening there. And so, and then when you read reports, it'll be things like, you know, there's one group that cut up a baby and like put it across the street and they'll use women as shields and things like that. So people are really hurt by these things, but I can't put that all in. So I think at one point I said something like, you know, this group has killed 3,000 people since 2017, it's one armed group there. And, and I said massacred, I wrote, because I think first I had written like three sentences about it, but those were cut pretty fast. And then they changed my word massacred to killed. And I wanted to put in like massacred with axes and machetes and guns. And then they wouldn't let me have those three words, but I, I fought to keep massacred. And I had to really justify, like I feel like kill is so clean and we're so accustomed to hearing like, oh, Africa's bad, people are killed. And I wanted to somehow pick a word that would like drive at least drive like some feeling like this is how bad it is guys <laughs> like so it is it's it's I think about those sentences a lot and we try and make a, a nice mix between concise and yeah and so it brings it home so when as a not now as a as a doctor treating a patient but as someone with experience of this firsthand who then tries to write reach out to the general public, how do you answer the same question? How do you control or, or uh, guard your language? I was gonna say I don't have the same limits as Amy does, partly because when I venture into that field, people are, are a lot more understanding that I'm not a journalist. And then a lot of times when I write about these things, they tend to be a lot more first person, so I have a lot more leeway. Um, you know, I, I think so. I wrote a couple of stories um, with NPR um, after my experiences. One was the personal part of working in an Ebola treatment unit, and then really was more um, evaluating health systems aspects that could have made the disease better. Um, I, I, I think my biggest battle is not falling into the expert mode and then realizing that what people really want to hear is what you were saying is, is it's the other way around. I tend to become too clean. I, I probably wouldn't use the word kill because it's, I, I fall into, into the expert mode. Um, so I have the opposite problem a little bit. I become too technical and too scientific. Technical. And that's a way of disconnecting. Uh -huh. So I had a discussion before we began here about how journalism really grabs the public's attention when you write about my health, my time, or my money. You've definitely got the health covered. But I'm wondering, you know, until or God forbid, unless this is this this disease jumps to the United States, that health issue is going to remain somewhat abstract and far away. And is there a way to bring this story with more urgency or relevance to uh, to a somewhat distracted American or even Western public? And or is it is it somewhat destined to remain a story that is somewhat uh, mysterious and hmm. abstract and exotic? An interesting question, Amy. How would you answer that? <laughs> it's hard. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. I think the truth is, it would it will be hard for any journalist to write a story that gets read. You know, when I wrote one, one of my stories from Sierra Leone, when I wrote about, um, I wrote I, I was upset about local healthcare workers not getting paid. Yet there was all these donations. So the way I drove it home was to be like, this is your taxpayer money. Like when the, when the US gives, do you realize that's you giving? <laughs> do you care where your money goes? 
So I tried to pitch it like that, you know, to kind of put a, us in the story. But um, I don't know, I hope, um, I know, I know like after I talked to, um, like I said, there was a reporter who got the vaccine, he's, uh, he's a videographer, and I'm thinking like, that's great, like he's a good videographer, and video is very powerful, so I'm hoping that there'll be really more good reporting, and it has to be things like, I mean, I like writing, but not a lot of people are gonna read 5,000 words, so I'm glad that there's gonna be a video out there and things like that, so, but no, it's not simple. So Nahid, how would you answer that question? I mean, is Ebola just a uh, just, you know, a distant um, humanitarian um, horror show that we're kind of watching uh, at a remove, or, you know, is is it a story that actually um, has direct, more direct relevance to yeah. readers or viewers in the U.S.? So. Um this won't come as a surprise to anyone, but I was a peace and justice studies minor. Um, <laughs> and all the literature out there about social movements talks about our people more driven by you telling them, you know, here's where your money and your time and your health is involved, or are they more driven by altruism? And, and I think someone could correct me because you guys are closer to all this stuff than I am at this point, but. I think that when people are uh, driven by altruism, they can be a lot more powerful as a force. And so do we sell the, this is a selfish reason why you should do it, or do we sell that this is the right thing to do? And that's, I don't know the answer to that, but if you really want the answer of like, how do you convince people this is the selfish reason to do it? Ebola is a litmus test. A litmus test for what? Ebola is a litmus test of how we're all connected um, as a world for um, around infectious diseases, right? Um, Ebola doesn't look like hemorrhage. I say this often, Ebola looks like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and only less than 20% of people have any hemorrhagic symptoms. I've seen 500 Ebola patients, only less than 20% had any kind of hemorrhagic fever features, right? And so uh, early on in that disease, it could be any disease, because a lot of infectious diseases look like that. And the reason we miss outbreaks is because health systems and all the things that allow Ebola to re wreak havoc and the conflict, the everything else, all the things that allow Ebola, which is much harder to get than a respiratory pathogen or something else, are exactly the right setting for when there is a pathogen that could affect us, when it's much easier to transmit, when it's much easier to come here and we won't be as prepared for it because, you know, we're, we have good health systems, but if it's a respiratory, um, and I'm, I'm not saying anything you don't already know, we live in this year of a novel influenza. Um, something that's respiratory transmitted because I don't think anybody in the world is that prepared to handle that. Ebola is a litmus test for how well and how quickly diseases like the next big one could spread in those scenarios and make it around the world. And that's the reason to invest in this because we go back and we make those health systems right along with this response, we will do better in catching other threats that come our way. Do you see it, Amy, as a, also a litmus test for good reporting? I don't know if I would go that far. I don't know if I, no, I don't know if I'd go that far. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'll be change the question. Yeah. So what have you learned as a reporter from covering yeah. outbreak in the field that now informs your reporting on other subjects mm. when you're back home covering, yeah. not covering Ebola? That's a, good, that's a good question. I think it's definitely made me more aware of, and reporting in general, reporting in places, you know, making sure to go to the place. I mean, think stories that do not include the people who get the diseases are going to be flawed. So not, so I think it's made me aware that you have to question everything you hear, <laughs> that you can't take anybody's word for it, really. Um, yeah, and, and to, to I think that's some of the big some of the big ones. And people who are even well intentioned, who we, you know, who we think that we trust, who yeah, so people might be have really good intentions and we might trust them, but also question their stories a little bit. And I think that's that's been kind of a lesson to me. So it's deepened your skepticism as a yeah. journalist? Mm hmm For that's, sure. That's always yeah. a good thing. <laughs> yes. I have a question here. Hello. Um, I was wondering how you both take care of your own mental health 
hmm. working on such a traumatic topic, um, especially such an urgent one. Excellent question. How do you keep yourself sane and happy in the middle of all of this, Nahid? Um, so I started saying this a little bit. I, I think during the West Africa outbreak, I'm going to start with some of the trauma that I think the healthcare workers here had. But imagine the trauma the healthcare workers here had and compare it to the trauma the healthcare workers and community members in affected countries had. Um, and so I know I'm depersonalizing it a little bit. I'm going to come mm -hmm. back to it. I, okay. I, think, um, I, I think that the thing that keeps me going is that there's still a mission. And it, that keeps me healthy. The other is actually being in a community of other people who are doing that and sort of who recognize mm -hmm. what the, you know, the important work is. And, and having a lot of hobbies. You know, if anybody tells you Lots hobbies are hobbies. bad, have a lot of hobbies huh. because it helps you disconnect from everything else you do. So I do photography. I mean, I have no shame in like, you know, saying this is, I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to take a ton of pictures, you know, and disconnecting from work, I think, helps a lot. Is there anything on a daily basis in that situation? I mean, do you, you know, meditate for five minutes in the morning? Oh, in the middle of a... Is there a punching bag you bring with you? I mean, just curious. This is a... Uh, in the worst months of that outbreak, I don't think I had a moment to breathe, to think about that. I, I was on autopilot. Amy, same question to you. Um, I think the short answer is I've, you know, day to day, I think when I'm reporting in the middle of it, I may, I try and go easy on the social things, like, you know, go back to my room at night and be alone a little bit, make sure I have space, like I'm not gonna over, over, and same thing once I get home from a trip that was, I saw a lot, I'll take it easy, I'll kind of stay in a lot. So I think just making sure I have some, some space and some alone time and don't over occupy myself. Um, and then yeah, there's, it's a form of, and maybe you feel this way medically, I was speaking of a doctor that I, Risa, this time, but for me personally, I feel like I, I want to do, uh, I want to talk about the people who I saw as very heroic in these. So because you, if you report on something really bad, it means the really good people are really good. So if I can kind of talk about somebody who's just completely amazing in a really dark circumstance, that makes mm -hmm. me feel better. So it's kind of a, oh. and I was thinking of, um, the question made me also think of this other doctor that I met in Sierra Leone, who then I ran into when I was in Beni, and this is in DRC. Uh, I don't know if you know Marta Lato. Uh, yeah, of uh, course. Okay. Yeah, she's amazing. She's at Partners in Health, and she's, well, I think she wasn't when she was there, but anyway, she's a doctor in an Ebola treatment unit, and she works throughout Sierra Leone outbreak in one of their public hospitals, and throughout the whole time, and she's just amazing, and treated hundreds of patients. Anyway, she's very cool. But she was saying it was kind of, I can't remember the word she used for it, but she said it was good for her, kind of her conscious in the second outbreak, because I guess medical care is a lot better right now. Yeah. So she was telling me that as a doctor, and I've not had to deal with any of this, but as a doctor, she was telling me it was horrible in Sierra Leone. So because she couldn't monitor, you know, she couldn't monitor, I don't know, basic things that were like blood chemistry. Um, she couldn't give people treatment. She couldn't, they couldn't do basic things that she could have done in Spain, which is where she's from. But in this outbreak, she's now able to like, she was like, we have biochemistry machines. And like, we could like monitor blood glucose. Like she was getting really excited about these basic measures besides the experimental drugs, which are also great. But she could now, she was saying, her way of dealing with her past kind of trauma was just to be able to see progress. So that it's, was kind of cool. For that's me to exactly, hear. yeah. I was going to say that's exactly why I stayed um, and I work with this project in Uganda. It felt like a full circle. Um, there's a, the project I currently work with in Uganda is a spiral hemorrhagic fevers clinical research center. It's a, again, the ability to give the, the best care possible um, with better resources. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it to me felt like coming full circle. Um, because that was the biggest trauma for, for healthcare workers, at least, was mm -hmm. uh, you knew you could do better, mm -hmm. and you, you know, the patients in front of you mm -hmm. could survive, and, and they didn't because you didn't have the resources. And you had to witness that again and again per patient for mm -hmm. the whole time that you were there. Yeah. No, it's an it's a interesting question. I mean, it is in case, I mean, certainly where I work, and I know other large news organizations that 
for journalists who are involved in crisis reporting, I mean, you know, it's now a pretty routine thing to offer sort of trauma mm. counseling afterwards and things like that. Um, so I now have this picture of you alone in your room pretending that you're okay, you know, I'm so sure. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to my mom a lot. Uh, okay. here. <laughs> uh, I have a question there. Um, hi. So my question is, since this is a problem that affects like vulnerable communities uh, in vulnerable parts of the world, sometimes I feel like some journalists tend to infan infantilize these people, like mm -hmm. they don't respect their full, they don't see them as full, like grown up people and like re-victimized in some way, um, these people. So I was wondering like good practices to avoid doing that because I really find it very annoying <laughs> whenever I encounter that sort of thing, especially like in, U.S. or European media. Yeah, how, how, how to avoid the condensation, uh, the, the condescension, excuse me, the condescension of people like me um, when viewing um, uh, people in the grips of uh, a crisis <coughs> like this, but who are part of a different culture. And one of the ways I can distance myself from the danger is to pretend that they're foolish and immature and have strange mm -hmm. and ridiculous customs that are putting them at risk, which of course, I don't share, so I'm safe. I mean, you've dealt with that. We talked about that a little bit um, with the burial practices at the outset of this conversation. But Nahid, I didn't give you a chance to sort of explore that idea, but I think this question gives you an opportunity. Well, I was going to say it's not just in journalism. We do that in public health, in spades. We do it in economic development in spades. You know, we tend to think that people are poor because they don't know how to be rich. They're poor because, and they survived, and they're actually more uh, innovative, more resourceful than you know than any of us who have grown up with a lot more resources. They've have actually been able to make a life with fewer resources, and that, in fact, is the opposite. You know, um, I, I I think that the whole people are not coming to care because, you know, that's a, my my pet of all things in Sierra Leone was all this complaint of like, why are people not coming to Ebola treatment units, you know? Um, and you've heard a little bit about the way Ebola treatment units were. I mean, they, uh, you've seen videos, you know, they were overcrowded. Uh, we did the best that we could. Um, part of what an Ebola treatment unit does is it isolates you from the community and keeps you from transmitting that disease. But look at it from the perspective of an individual. You have fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You don't know if it's Ebola or not, so they're going to take you to an Ebola treatment unit. You're going to wait to get your test, but you're going to be sitting around people who are going to go on to get Ebola. Why would you do that if you think your chances of Ebola, getting Ebola, are pretty low? Because most of the time, they're aware. People are surprised when I say less than 1% of the population of West Africa was affected by Ebola directly. I mean, huge numbers affected other ways. Right, like chances were, if you had fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you did not have Ebola. You know, uh, but we brought you in because it was the safest thing to do in areas where there were, um, where there was disease. And if you're someone who thinks that they have Ebola, do you want to go into a treatment center where there's so few healthcare workers that they can't provide good care to you, where you know people are walking around in astronaut suits? So would you rather spend the last days of your life with your family members, taking care of you? Which one would you rather do? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a hard, it's not as easy as people think of like, oh, people are just not educated and that's why they're not seeking care. There are very mm -hmm. logical reasons for why they're not mm -hmm. seeking care and there are very logical reasons for why they're not seeking mm -hmm. care in DRC. You know, it's the trauma, it's the fear, the security mm -hmm. issues, it's, it's distrust, it's, you know, it's, it's some of these elements because there are parts of, mm -hmm. yes, care has improved, but not in all areas of DRC is what I've heard. Um, so this gets it, it's a good question because it gets at something that journalists often aren't very good at, which is treating the people they cover with dignity and respect. Um, mm. Do you have like a, a, a set of rubrics in your head when you go into a new situation like this to make you pay attention to the people that you're encountering who, um. under other circumstances, you might be culturally inclined to dismiss? Oh. I think, yeah, I'm more talkative when I'm in journalist mode. So <laughs> certainly, I mean, all I can do is just try my hardest to constantly just be humbled and remember you probably don't know where somebody's coming from. 
you know, like, yeah, with this, I've even thought about this word, like saying people don't trust the health system. And I'm like, that's not quite right, because you want to be like, why should they? Or where are they coming from? Um, and yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I learned, and also I'm, I, I mess up, and I try and not mess up. So I think that's a big part of it. There was like one Ebola survivor that I talked to a lot in, in Kenema in Sierra Leone. And at some point, because I, you know, I went, I spent a lot, I spent three months kind of total there, so I got to go back and see a lot of people again. And at some point, we were just walking around, and he told me that, like, because when I'm questioning, I'm also wanting to get a story. So um, I have to ask a lot of details that maybe somebody else might not. This is actually why I don't personally, I don't talk to, I don't interview kids usually, because I feel like I don't really know how to do that when we're going through something traumatic. But if it's an adult and they want to talk, and I feel like we're there, I, you know, if somebody's like, you know, I walked over bodies to get to the bathroom, I'll be like, well, about how many bodies do you think? So it's, uh, it's pretty intense. But I need those details, kind of, because I'm telling a story. And also it helps people remember because memory's funny and it helps them be like, actually, it wasn't in the hospital that day. It was in this. So anyways, you want to ask the details. but. Later, I talked to that survivor, and he told me that like he was super depressed after talking to me for days, didn't leave home. So I clearly brought up a lot of stuff. That would happen to me every time someone would ask me a question of like, um, well, it was not just when I got interviewed, but when I talked about it, right? Because it was, it was, I felt like this was part of advocacy. I would give, go and give talks, you know, I would do, because I do have a bias. I'm very open about that, clearly. <laughs> Um, but every time I talked about it, it tore open a wound. Mm. You know, it was like, yes, I have to go there to tell you what it was like. But the minute I go there, yeah. And I think, yeah. So yes, it hurts people, and I like still. Sometimes I'll feel like, okay, I have to make sure to go slower, and I'll spend a long time. So even after we talk, I'll try and talk for longer after that, or stay in touch with that person somehow, you know, if, if it's possible to stay in touch over Facebook or something or WhatsApp or whatever, if they have those things, text messages, I feel like at least it makes me feel less cruel a little bit and it makes me show, okay, this is a person and like I'm engaged with their life, but it doesn't always happen that way. So I guess the answer is to remember that, yeah, everybody's a person and that these are traumatic moments and I never want to make, if somebody doesn't want to talk about a thing, first of all, I never make them, but if they will, just to take time, because it is really, it's traumatizing for them. I want to change the subject just slightly. Um, I'm curious about your tools. Um, when you were working remotely, uh, how do you stay in touch with your editors? What, what, what do you use for, how do you record? Uh, do you organize yourself right then and there in terms of your notes? Uh, do you save it all up in an a, a, a envelope and then bring them all home with you and sort through it when you're back in San Francisco, mm -hmm. Oakland? I mean, what? Let's start with that. So, 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 what? Are, what are your tools? What are the? What are the good? What's your field kit? Um, I like typing more than writing. So, if I'm talking to like a scientist or a doctor, I can be like, Hey, can I just type while we talk? and then I'll type. But there's other situations where I'm on the move or if I'm a computer would be really awkward to bring out, so I have a notebook and I have a recorder. I pref you know, so, yeah. So my tools are really pretty basic. Recorder, notebook, and my laptop. And then at night, if, you know, what at night I try to do or if I'm in a car going somewhere is I just, quick, and I'm a fast typer, so I quickly try and just think of what are the most what are the things that stand out to me that day? So maybe I had a conversation with someone and I'll go and I'll tape little notes to myself about, you know, even if I wasn't taking notes then, and I'm not gonna be quoting from this thing that I'm doing from, I never quote from memory because I don't have a good memory, but just things to remember like, oh yeah, do I remember that, you know, uh, there was this incident happened where these, this group blocked the road, I'm gonna you know, write down what that was like as quick as I can on my laptop. I like that more than recording because I hate, hate transcribing. Yeah, I think hating transcribing is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> totally. Someone told me you do something interesting when you're working on a long mm. story.
story, mm -hmm. which is that you pick a piece of music. Oh, that's like um, I wrote a blog once. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they haunt you forever. Um, <laughs> and you play that music yeah. over and over <laughs> while you're working on a long piece. Why do you do that? That makes me sound super crazy. Well, one is I don't want to stop what I'm doing to have to figure out what to play next. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I guess it kind of helps me get in the space of it because I want to put myself, you know, now if I, if I was a feature, maybe I've been not been there for a month or something, so I want to put myself back in the place and I guess somehow it, that can remind, maybe somehow it puts me back in the, it, it helps me be like, I'm in the zone of doing this thing now. I think it helps somehow memory a little bit. Nahid, you told me that people treat you differently when you're approaching them as a doctor and when you're approaching them as a writer, as a journalist, I guess. I don't know if I deserve that label. <laughs> well, uh, let's be aspirational. Okay. Um, I wonder if you shared that a little bit uh, about that with us because many um, uh, scientists now, of course, have the ability and the machinery, social media, whatever, they can take their stories directly to the public, but it, it then changes what they're doing and it kind of changes their role. And you've gone back and forth, so I'm just curious about your sense of how you get treated as a doctor and how you get treated as a, a writer, if you don't like the word journalist. Right. Um, well, I, I find that people, are, for clear reasons, I think people are a lot more open. Um, when I'm just one of their community, you know, and versus if I'm approaching them as, hey, I'm going to write about this, you know, I'm coming to you as a, as a journalist or whatever. Um, and I think it just, you know, digging that a little bit more, I, I think it's partly because people are a lot more cautious, ac people, academics, researchers, doctors, scientists tend to be very cautious um, when we talk to media. Um, mm -hmm. and. The reason why is there's one of the worst fears we have is that we give the wrong information or that information is not transmitted the right way and it has an impact on people in a way that it shouldn't, right? So perfect example is a long time ago, I was interviewed about, um, you know, about where the virus may survive after someone survives Ebola. And, you know, I'd given a certain number of sites and then somebody had put an extra site in there that I'd not said. Um, it was like the knee or something, and I was like, no, there's no evidence of that. It's such a small thing to them, but I was like, no, because now everybody's going to think Ebola is in the knee, you know, like, <laughs> it's a big deal, and like, all these survivors are going to think that <laughs> Ebola is in their knee, and like, it was, it was, it, it's a small example, you know, I had to like, do all this stuff about like, no, you have to amend that, you don't understand, it's, it's a public health impact. We fear that our language will hurt the very people that we are trying to help, and that we will say something inexact, and we will... Um, spread misinformation, right? Um, so people are a lot more careful when they speak to someone who you're just having a conversation with because you're sort of having a casual conversation um, and, you, and the implicit caveats and uncertain uncertainties are understood. Versus if you speak to a journalist, it feels like now it's your responsibility uh, to be as concise, as, as accurate um, as you can because it's going to be on a bigger scale. And that's why I think people are a lot more closed down when they talk to journalists in my field. So I'm curious, when you call people as a doctor, do they return your calls more quickly than if you call them as a journalist? I haven't had to call them as a journalist that much. <laughs> I think it was just a few times. Uh, yeah, I often call, I email people and I say, hey, can we talk about the study findings? You know, can you, can you, I'm having trouble figuring this out and putting this in, together with the rest of my like understanding of this. You know, can we have a conversation? People go, sure, I'm busy, but I'll talk to you next week. People are mm -hmm. very open about that mm -hmm. because I, I think it's, in the, the best, when science is done well, it's collaborative because we're all building one big body of knowledge and we're just patching on stuff over time and peeling stuff on and patching it on again. And that is a collaboration, you know? Um, so we tend to be a lot more collaborative or at least the best of us tend to be collaborative. Amy, at the heart of this kind of reporting, it seems to me, more than, than, than other subjects is uncertainty. Mm. Uncertainty about outcome, uncertainty about fate, uncertainty about 
what causes panic and what doesn't. Um, as a journalist trying to broker this for a broad lay public, how, how do you handle uncertainty? How do you communicate uncertainty? What, what, how do you approach that? Um, well, I guess it's to be clear about when something's not known. You know, there was this study on the vaccine that's being used right now, and I know that it's not a controlled trial where they, they came up with more than 97% effective, so I think when it first came out, I just said it was probably really highly effective. <laughs> and I'll note, but it's not a trial. Uh, so I think I try and couch things you know, as uncertain when I can and as few as, if, as few words as I can. I was gonna say something about, I was thinking of when, if you don't mind, when, when I was talking, I was just thinking of something when I can see why a lot of scientists actually, as scientists and sometimes aid groups get really worried about talking to the press. And people usually respond to me, but I've had a number of people say like, but I'm not going to talk to you unless you make sure that you show me your story ahead of time and I can make changes. And it's because of accuracy, and a lot of them are, are for reasons that she's talking about that are very real. Like, we don't want somebody to panic because now you've told them that Ebola is airborne. Um, it's not. It's not, <laughs> it's not at all. <laughs> um, so I have like a set of things that I say that will win over some people and not all people. And the people who doesn't win over, it's okay, they can go. Um, but. What I like to tell sort of like scientists or you know, people who are afraid to talk with me because for very good reasons, this, uh, I'll say like, first of all, you know, look at my past work, see that I'm, I'm really gonna try and get this right. Like accuracy is very important to me. And also like, if there's a particular thing that you are really worried about, like let's talk about that too. Like tell me about the fact that like you, I have to say, you know, if Ebola remains in somebody's eye, can it be transmitted? Like, let's talk about your fear of, of where the reporting can go wrong. And that usually is really helpful because a lot of times it's things that I wouldn't have even thought of. But the scientist who's telling me it has already experienced that thing and they're like ready to, to tell me about, you know, what they don't want me to mess up on. And I, that's, I find that to be really helpful. When I went to DRC this last time with the World Health Organization it was sort of the same. I was I don't I usually try not to embed with groups, but it was a, it's a conflict situation. I wanted to be in their armored vehicles uh, when I was in places that were uh, risky. So you know, but I we talked about things up front. No, I'm not going to show you the draft, but tell me what you're worried about, um, just so you know. And when you're when when I you know we'll set ground rules right off the bat, sort of like how this is going to go. So. Yeah, if so I agree to off the record, we'll do it. So that kind of thing. You negotiate. No, I'm yeah. curious. So, how would you negotiate that from the other side? What do you? What kind of tests do you uh, administer before you decide you're going to talk to a journalist? Yeah, I, I think the prior work part is really important to me. As and that's just a, a trial and error. I mean, I've been burnt in the past, um, and now there are people that I know report with with that kind of care, and they understand that. I would love that if people said, tell me what you're worried about that might come out wrong, because I will. Like I, have, like, I feel like if I say this wrong, I don't want this to come across this way. Here's my fear of why I want to say it this mm. way. And I hope that, you know, if, even if you don't use my words, that you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I would love that. I, but, the, but the issue, I think, inherent in our field, and our, by our field, I mean, subset of infectious diseases, folks that work on emerging infectious diseases, is there is uncertainty. And we are just understanding these diseases. And as data comes out, we're negotiating that against the existing body of knowledge. And we're trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. You know, it's a perfect example is if you might remember um, during the West Africa outbreak, CDC suggested personal protective equipment and then they changed it. Maybe this is didn't make the major media stuff, but people were like, CDC knows nothing. You know, why did they change the personal protective equipment? Like, how did they, did they not know like this could hurt? And the thing was, it was changed through practice. It was changed through people learning in the field. And then it was then adapted into policy, which was then negotiated into practice for everybody, everybody else. And it's, it's such an evolving thing for us that we're afraid of also being like caught in a static moment where we might, someone 
says something stupid and that turns out to be completely false. That's why you'll never hear us say, like, I'm 100% sure, you know, except for the vaccine autism thing. I'm 100% sure <laughs> vaccines do not cause autism. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe, maybe this is the last question I want to ask mm. you. So there, you know, outbreaks continue. Mm. There may or may not be um, uh, an outbreak in another country. Where um, are you? Are you packing your bags? <laughs> I think there definitely will be an outbreak in another country, and I think we can. I think well, there's things that are predictable. There will be an outbreak in another country, and it, the place where it will explode and get bad will be in a place that has a very weak health system and is like unstable. That's everything that Nadia was saying. We're, so that's expected, and I would hope that we could figure out that maybe by helping those health systems, we'll have mm -hmm. less of those. But am I packing my bags? Yes, I definitely like reporting on this sort of thing. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's, it hits, it ticks a lot of boxes. It's um, important to me. It's, there's, you know, to the extent that stories are um, interesting people kind of overcoming challenges or battling challenges, it, it ticks those boxes of being a good story pretty easily. Um, because, yeah, there are incredible people and, yeah, I, I'm interested. I just got my, like, I reboosted my vaccines, not for Ebola, for the other things, just thinking, I don't know when I'm going, but yeah, of course I'm gonna go when something happens. Well, I can just tell you earlier, we were talking about, well, litmus, you know, for good reporting. Mm. I can say this was litmus for a great Cavalry conversation, well, and it's you. gonna, this has been thoughtful and intimate and honest, and I thank you and our audience very, very much for what we've done here this evening. Thank you.